Let us start to to ten minutes past two. That's the hour we agree to begin this um, afternoon session. This is to be a session of debate about the uh, democratic controls, and we have here um, 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 some distinguished scholars, some of them have already been uh, introduced. Professor José Sheibubi was here yesterday giving a lecture, so he was already introduced. You know him. Um, Matthew Taylor uh, did the same in this morning, was uh, introduced already. So I, it's my uh, task now to introduce Marcos André Mello that has a PhD from Sussex University and is currently professor of political science at the Federal University of Pernambuco and a columnist at Folha de São Paulo. He was a visiting professor at Yale and MIT and a Guggenheim Fellow. His work has appeared in scholarly outlets such as the Journal of Democracy, Legislative Studies Quarterly, Comparative Political Studies, and Journal of Comparative Economics. He is a co-author of Brazil in Transition uh, with Carlos Pereira. Against, uh, and Against the Odds, Politicians, Institutions, and the Fight Against Poverty, and Making Brazil Work, one of them, which one is with, uh, only with Carlos? And the other one is with uh, Alston. James Manor. It's not in here. Um, his research interests include public policy, political institution, accountability, and corruption. So we are uh, here. We will discuss um, accountability, corruption, and this uh, uh, Teams. So we agreed that uh, only Matthew would be allowed to use uh, PowerPoint. The others were uh, forbidden to use by José Carlos Sheibubi, that is very authoritative on these points. He said we could not use. So he allowed Matthew to use. Matthew can use. Then uh, we will follow with Marcos and then José, and I'm kind of doing the organization of the debate. Okay, Great. thank you. So, Matthew. Okay. Uh, well, I'm kind of picking up where we left off this morning. And um, uh, just to remind you where we left off, we were talking about two different concepts, one of a policy burst and one of an equilibrium shift. And I think that the big question is to understand where Brazil is and to think about Brazil within the long durée. Right? and thinking about Brazil over decades, um, because I think we have, as I mentioned this morning, gotten a little caught up in Lava Jato and not thought as much about what has been happening in anti-corruption work more broadly, including previous scandals in you know, the Kohler impeachment, the scandal, the budget dwarfs, uh, various other, the Banestado case, many other cases but then also the institutional innovations that have happened as a result. And I also want to think a little bit about uh, how this history fits into, or how Lava Jato fits into this history, and then how Lava Jato and Brazil fits into Lava, uh, uh, the impact of corruption more broadly in the hemisphere. So I won't, uh, I think everybody in Brazil knows the story and knows about the settlement that happened uh, in the Odebrecht and Braskem case in the United States. Um, I, I think probably everybody is aware of the hemispheric impact uh, of this particular case in terms of the wide number of countries in which bribes were paid and then the estimated benefits that were obtained in each of those countries. And then also, of course, the, the political ramifications of this. And we've seen just a number of important political ramifications, including most recently the removal of um, PPK in Peru, uh, partly in consequence of some of the revelations with Odebrecht. And I think what we can say about uh, the region's response is that there's been some improvement uh, 
across the board in this particular case. And we've seen uh, greater transparency among governments. We've seen the effects of prosecutorial independence. Many of these countries had undertaken some sort of a national strategy, partly as a consequence of civil society pressure. Um, in all of these countries, with uh, the exception of Venezuela, you had civil society actually engaged in uh, accountability actions. And, uh, sorry folks. Um, and um, we've also seen, even two years in, two or three years in, we have seen that many of the, the effects of the scandal have led to reform. Politicians under pressure because of the scandal actually pushing forward reform. What is not working, though, in the region uh, is, I think we can say with uh, fairly good accuracy for all of the countries that were in that map, the judiciary. And I think here there's an interesting phenomena for those of you who, who study the judiciary. Uh, most of Latin America, Brazil accepted, have has undertaken a wide number of adversarial reforms, switching over to a system that looks a little bit more like the US criminal justice system. And um, those reforms appear to have had zero effect uh, in terms of the corruption scandal and the capacity to deal with corruption. A second thing that has been, uh, I think, more universal than we probably would like is the degree of state incapacity and when you look at the Peruvian case, when you look at the uh, you know, other countries in the region that ha are trying to address the impact of Odebrecht, uh, you see that many of the states simply do not have the capacity to engage in any kind of active um, anti-corruption effort. This morning we also talked about politicization and um, you know, I think Brazil is in no way an exception I think it, it, politicization of anti-corruption efforts is probably more the rule than the exception. And then there's the problem that we spent all morning talk about, talking about, or I spent all morning talking at you about, um, which is this notion of the long slog. And it, we just can't expect that Odebrecht and Braskem uh, will be resolved and lead to immediate changes in uh, the entire hemisphere. But there is some, I think, uh, something new about Odebrecht, and, and you see it in the way, in the language I'm using, I'm talking about Odebrecht, Braskem, and the settlement. There is increasing international pressure across the hemisphere. And here I'm not just talking about the Odebrecht scandal, but also beyond it, we see a number of ways in which international institutions, foreign governments, including the US government, but not just the US government, are trying to create networks to constrain corruption. And so um, we see in, in Honduras and Guatemala the installation of foreign bodies to judge corruption. Uh, we see bilateral cooperation in the case of Switzerland and Lava Jato. I don't think you could have had the Lava Jato case without Swiss cooperation, or it certainly wouldn't have gone in the same direction without the information that Brazil was able to obtain from Switzerland. Uh, we see new attempts at multilateral cooperation, and uh, one of the best examples comes out of Lava Jato, which is this uh, 2017 agreement between prosecutor prosecutors. We see extraterritorial enforcement. I mean, I think one of the reasons that we know as much as we know about what Odebrecht was up to was because they were forced into an agreement at the cost, at enormous cost, um, and they could not afford to... Um, to, to not deal with the US Department of Justice and the SEC in the United States. But we see that with other cases too, like Siemens and FIFA, where there's extraterritorial enforcement. Um, and then, of course, peer pressure, governments pressuring each other to make improvements. And the, the best examples here are the OECD and the Financial Action Tax Force. And not to be... Um, Minimized is the impact on business. And so uh, the ability of shareholders to impose a cost on corrupt businesses. And here we see the example of Gerdau, which is under uh, you know, danger of, of, of losing some major lawsuits. Uh, we just saw a settlement in New York of Petrobras's case uh, in favor of shareholders and a very significant penalty. So, um, you'll remember this equation, I won't go back over it, but 
I, what I wanted to do was actually go and look at how Brazil compares in terms of this equation. And I didn't create this data. I just went and found indicators that would fit the, the different categories here. And let me just show you, uh, I want to bring it back to Brazil now. The, the number, the, the two things I'd like you to focus on is first that top line. That top line is the mean for these countries that were involved in the scandal. And that's sort of the sum of all of these factors. And remember, I'm not a big fan of this um, as, an, as an equation, but it does tell us kind of a general direction. And you can see that Brazil is head and shoulders above the region. And I think this is important to keep in mind. But then look at the lower line. And <clears throat> what I want you to focus on there, that is um, drawn at where Brazil's sanctioning power lies. So this is looking at the judiciary, right? So it, it's based on... that Brazil is not doing as well as uh, we might uh, hope. And I think that this is, in the language of our presentation of the discussion this morning, this is a key bottleneck that needs to be thought about uh, as Brazil moves forward. So um, I don't think I want to reprise all of the arguments that I've, I've made in, in work that I've done with uh, Sergio Praça about how uh, Brazil's accountability system has improved, also work with Tim Power. Uh, this acronym WOA is, the, is a word, is a phrase that's drawn from Scott Mainwaring who talks about the web of accountability institutions. And I think if we look at Brazil, uh, there are a number of ways in which this web of self-reinforcing accountability institutions have uh, improved the overall accountability uh, results. Uh, I talked this morning about the national strategy, uh, ENCLA. Uh, another aspect here is simply that the people who are supposed to engage in anti-corruption work have learned a great deal. Uh, here you see one of the recurrent actors uh, who's been around since Banestado and perhaps before the Banestado case at the turn of the century, uh, Alberto Youssef. And, you know, one of the things I'm always struck by is if you interview judges, if you interview prosecutors, if you interview the federal police here, one of the things you learn is they've been on this guy's case, they've been on his tail for two decades. And he's taught them a lot. He's a great professor. Um, because he's really kind of showed them where the problems are in the system. And then I think that there's another factor here, which is simply popular pressure. And certainly the protests of uh, 2013, beginning in 2013, but continuing, they're amorphous, they're anomic, they have many motivations. I'm aware of all of this, but I think that we, it's no coincidence that we see, for example, Dilma Rousseff on three different occasions in the wake of protest, putting forward proposals for legislative changes that would improve accountability. So I think that this is all uh, very helpful in changing the way um, Brazilian institutions are functioning. Now, uh, you know, just to say a little bit about what's working well in comparative perspective, this is uh, Transparency International data that looks at people who paid a bribe when accessing basic services. And in comparative perspective, Brazil looks really good. It does very well hemispherically and uh, even in international uh, uh, comparison beyond the region. A second place where we've seen important improvements, this is uh, from work that I did with Kate Bursch and Sergio Praça, and we looked at capacity and autonomy of different uh, federal agencies in Brazil. And what I want you just to focus on here is that the top quadrant there is the quadrant of high capacity and high autonomy agencies that are doing perhaps better than their peers. And I have in red there an average of the latent variables that we created for each agency. And you'll see that legal and law enforcement agencies are pretty high up there. And of course, that's within the Brazilian context. But Brazil is already known to be the highest capacity 
federal bureaucracy in the region. So this is already head and shoulders above uh, the rest of the region. Also in terms of capacity, here you see some data, and I'm sorry it's not very visible here, but these are various um, accountability agencies. And you'll see the first column in blue is the staff in 1989, and the second column is in red is 2012. And you can see that um, across a wide range of accountability bodies, the Central Bank, the CGU, the uh, National Justice Council, COAFI, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Federal Police, the Ministerio Público, the Federal Revenue Service, and um, the Accounting Tribunal, there's been an improvement in, in staffing. Government has also gotten better at policing itself. And this is some data from uh, the work that I did with Sergio. And you can see here um, both an increase in the number of federal civil servants who are being kicked out for corrupt behavior, and then also uh, uh, the potential return on special audits conducted by the Comptroller General. Also, there's been an improvement in the prosecution of wrongdoing, and particularly corrupt wrongdoing. And this is data from uh, work by Silvio Lefkowitz, who was a fellow with us at AU. And this, um, you can see the different governments. And there's good news and there's bad news here, obviously. But if you look at the bottom line, that's the high court, the STF. You look at the green line, the STG, J. And then the red line are the, the regional appeals court. And so you can see a, a, a gradual improvement over time. Not, um, not a, a, a great imp improvement, especially in the high courts. Maria Arminia, I, I won't use it. I'll, thank you. Uh, but um, nonetheless, some improvement. But I think you know, you're beginning to see where I'm going in terms of the bottleneck here. And I would argue that one of the key bottlenecks uh, is going to be in the courts. And so we can think about a lot of different precursors for corruption that have been mentioned in the literature on Brazil. Electoral rules, having an open list, uh, proportional representational system is very expensive. Then there's the campaign finance thing, which is problematic. Coalitional presidentialism and the argument about um, you know, uh, horse trading, political appointments fits into that. But then kind of encompassing all of that is this uh, big issue of judicial impunity. And this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly wrap up here so that others have a chance to, to speak, but just to give you some data on judicial impunity, uh, this is uh, uh, the result of a, a somewhat data now, it's a little bit old, it's a 2011 study that Folha uh, published on the top 10 salient scandals in Brazil. And you can see here that you had about 900, 800 people implicated, 55 who were convicted, but only nine who actually went to jail uh, on any kind of final conviction. Also in this same um, uh, uh, line, what you can see here is this is the number of cases in the judiciary, 95 million, and I had to blow up the dot to 10 times its size. That's the number of people who have gone to jail in any court, in, in any um, jurisdiction in Brazil on corruption charges. And, you know, I think we all know that the courts in Brazil are um, overburdened, I guess is the, the way to say it. And uh, you can see in this graph and then in the, in the table here, the congestion rates of Brazilian courts are practically an insurance policy uh, against any kind of timely resolution of any kind of case, but it's particularly important when we're thinking about uh, corruption cases, where a timely resolution is very important, particularly because in the Brazilian legal system, the period of prescription is so short, especially in corruption cases. And so uh, the congestion rate we're looking at here in the federal courts is already two-thirds, meaning you're not resolving two-thirds of the cases in any given year. And basically, what you're doing is you're resolving the, the flow that's coming in, but the stock remains. Uh, and it's even worse in the state and, um, you know, sort of nationwide as a consequence. So I'll wrap it up here, but the summary is, I guess, um, that 
as we're thinking about the improvements that, that have been made, I think it's important not to forget that there's been a great deal of improvement over the years, but then also not to lose sight of the fact that there are some key bottlenecks that are still uh, very pervasive. So thank you. Thanks, Matthew. So now we move to Marcus. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm honored by the invitation. Thank you, Maria Herminia and, and Sebrapi. Uh, so I, um, I'm going to react to uh, the previous presentations by, by Matthew uh, by trying to establish a, a, a link between um, you know, some more specific analysis of corruption with the broader institutional uh, landscape or, or to the broader uh, constitutional uh, structure, if you, if you, if you want. Um, I, I missed uh, Jose's presentation. It, 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 it's a pity, so uh, um, let me start by uh, referring to the two uh, covers by the economist that Fernando uh, mentioned uh, earlier uh, this morning. The first one uh, that came up, uh, everybody uh, is well known, the cover uh, which has the uh, Christ, Christ the Redemptor at the, the top and Brazil was taking off and uh, in 2013 Brazil was was um, uh, in a decline, right? 2013, so uh, two years before the, the crisis that led to the impeachment. Um, so this is very, very, uh, these two covers are very significant to my argument uh, because uh, we have to bear in mind that Brazil was seen as a role model for many countries. I myself participated in international seminars having Brazil as, as a model, a gov governance model uh, in various multilateral institutions and so on. So uh, what happened, right? We are at the crossroads now and there's this very uh, a strong feeling, very strong disenchantment, uh, I, much more than a, a simple institutional or political malaise. So, um, is there anything wrong with Brazilian, Brazil's institutions that uh, we might uh, blame for this uh, collapse uh, that we, we are facing? Are Brazilian institutions dysfunctional? These are uh, questions that we have to, to address uh, in connection to, with the, the discussion of, of, uh, with corruption, about corruption. <clears throat> Um, and because I see what happened as primarily the result of two exogenous shocks, I'm, uh, I could say that I'm less pessimistic than most people, so there's a sort of mitigated optimism. Uh, and let me um, uh, tell you specifically why. Um, Brazil, Let's put it in, in a broader perspective, right? In Brazil faced two tremendous shocks in 2010. Uh, the first one was the uh, international uh, financial crisis, right? That uh, the Economist, by the way, had a cover uh, which had the return of Leviathan. So it was the return of Keynesianism uh, in, the, in, in the U.S. And that crisis in itself had tremendous repercussions in Brazil. We could say that there was already a, an important fiscal imbalance in Brazil resulting from, from uh, several uh, problems in, in the Brazilian economy and so on, particularly uh, fiscal problems. But that, that uh, exogenous shock uh, was the key, the key element that led to a sort of uh, 
changing the incentive structure that policymakers faced in Brazil. So uh, Brazil was in the cover for being such a successful uh, case, primarily because there was this specific transition from alternation of power from Cardozo to Lula. Macroeconomic stability was kept and so on. And this exogenous shock in the Brazilian economy uh, changed um, basic macroeconomic policy. So from 2009 to 2010, Brazil embarked on a fiscal, uh, fiscal policies that destabilized tremendously the, the economy. The other external shock was that um, uh, had already uh, taken place by then, which had, had been the commodity, uh, commodity boom. Um, the commodity boom is um, a product of the, uh, the rise of China and of globalization and so on. And unlike what happened in uh, democracies in Europe, the US and so on, there was no globalization losers here. Quite the opposite. We had this commodity boom that relaxed fiscal constraints and led to a to extensive uh, redistributive policies and uh, had a fiscal cost. So uh, in, in, in the established democracies, we had this phenomenon of this, uh, of populism was, was very clearly a result of this, uh, the, the, this shock. So this shock here was, was very positive at the moment, but uh, that led to, that coincided with the discovery of the uh, pre-salt reserves, the largest reserve, oil reserve in the world. And um, obviously that produced fiscal euphoria and that was, had severe consequences in Brazil. So all of this I'm, I'm telling uh, uh, you guys because there was a, uh, what I call the black swan in Brazil, which was the combination of uh, this tremendous fiscal crisis that resulted from these two shocks with um, the, the big oily, right, the petrol loan, which, which is the largest uh, corruption scandal uh, uh, in, in history, uh, according to certain uh, uh, sources. So um, this black swan explains a lot of Brazil's uh, vicissitudes. Um, not that everything was rosy uh, before. Uh, there are several problems in Brazilians uh, which has institutional roots in, in, in Brazil and also severe problems in, in, in terms of uh, productivity, uh, fiscal um, uh, problems and so on. That, um, the crisis was unleashed by this combination of the, uh, this colossal gargantuan corru corruption scandal and a very severe economic crisis. From all, all, um, all we know about uh, um, in the impeachment literature, and Anibal Perslinian had already uh, examined this in detail, uh, the combination, there's an interaction effect of a severe economic uh, crisis and corruption scandal. Uh, and of course, this, this produces tremendous, um, tremendous institutional stability. And that was precisely what happened. So by 2014, we could easily predict that uh, a, an impeachment uh, was high a, a high uh, outcome, a, a likely outcome, um, on the basis of the existing literature. So, to a large extent, what Brazil is going through these days is, is a product of these two, two, um, two sources. Uh, this, this goes against, this explanation goes against what kind of explanation? It goes against some what I call hyper-institutionalist approaches or explanations to, uh, 
to Brazil, which uh, attributes the malaise to the current malaise or the current crisis to, um, to coalitional presidentialism, to the extreme level of fragmentation of our legislature, of our um, uh, pattern of uh, political finance and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, it, although these, there are a lot to say about uh, uh, dysfunctional elements in each of these, uh, these um, um, institutional uh, uh, institutions in, or institutional arrangements, um, what we, we had was, to take the example, uh, I guess uh, Zé uh, mentioned that before, we, we did not have a typical crisis of presidentialism, a Lindsayan crisis, a la Juan Lins, right? We, we had no confrontation between um, the president and um, the legislature or the, the Supreme Court. So we, we had no problem of dual legitimacy in typical of alleged presidential, presidentialism uh, crisis, uh, we, we didn't have, uh, in fact, what we had was a dual illegitimacy problem, whereas uh, the president was itself uh, involved in a major corruption scandal, and a, a large swathes of the, the, the of, of legislators were, were also, and are being currently indicted and, and uh, accused of crimes and, and so on. So that, that's the situation we've had over the last two years. So no, no crisis of presidentialism in, in that. Um, what, we, uh, what we have seen uh, over the last um, four years is uh, evidence of uh, the strengthening of Czech institutions in Brazil. And uh, the way I see um, uh, these, these institutions is that um, they have become uh, strong over time, uh, stronger, uh, partly as a result of design of purposive action and partly uh, as a result of these non-anticipated and exogenous elements, namely uh, this colossal corruption scandal <laughs> And, and, and the crisis and, and, so, and so on. So why is it that I, I say that it is partly uh, a, a product of design? Um, these institutions um, were, uh, have been strong because there were extensive powers delegated to them in the Constituent Assembly in 1988. Uh, we, we're currently working uh, in a project looking at what we call constitutional moments all over Latin America, and we explain the level of degree of, of delegation, the degree of delegation to, to the judicial system, to the Supreme Court, to um, the public ministry, to the audit institutions, and, and so on, as a, as a result primarily of uh, uh, power fragmentation and, and, and political competition. And uh, we had very extensive uh, delegation of powers in our constitution. So according to some metrics, no other court in the world has, has the, the, the jurisdiction that our Supreme Court has. It's the only court in the world where you have um, three kinds of, of, uh, of attributions. Um, it, it works as a criminal court. Uh, as an appeals court and as a, a constitutional court. No other co court is so powerful. Our pu public ministry, according to, uh, to, to the literature, uh, has no other, has no similar elsewhere uh, with the exception of, of Italy uh, and, and so on. So the level of delegation of power was very extensive. And, uh, but it, it could be just um, a, 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 an outcome from the constitutional moments, as we call these constitutional uh, assembly. But what, what, what is key to the sustainability of uh, 
of these institutions, of these powerful institutions, is political competition. Political competition is key to the sustainability. And over the last uh, 25 years in Brazil, we've, we've had uh, a very fragmented political system, very fragmented legislature, but there was a structure in chaos. We have two camps with a strong competition, a slim margin of victory of one, one uh, camp over the other, and that sustained uh, these institutions. And um, uh, it, it was key to, to, to understanding what's going on right now. So uh, the, the black swan that I referred to earlier, which uh, uh, I, I meant the combination of this gargantuan corruption scandal and the economic crisis, led, of course, to the weakening of the, the presidency to an unprecedented level. So despite the fact that we have a very powerful, constitutionally speaking, uh, presidency, uh, in terms of popularity and in terms of, uh, its, of the partisan powers of presidents in Brazil, we reach this extremely low level. And um, this, this led to the impeachment. So the impeachment was not uh, the product of uh, as I see it, uh, of a, a of purposive action, um, uh, usually this is a a bit complex to 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 synthesize here. So I just uh, mentioned that I I see it as the non anticipated outcome of of um, the strategic interaction between actors in that, uh, in that uh, conjuncture, because the major political forces did not want the, uh, unlike many arguments out there, uh, I see this as a, a no anticipated outcome. Um, and we could um, discuss this uh, later. Uh, so this, uh, this particular uh, outcome uh, was was very uh, instrumental for um, for the rise of these Czech institutions, as we I call it, um, extending the argument, uh, and, and the centrality it occupies in the current uh, political political um, uh, conjuncture. Um, so, um, I'll have to, to, to summarize here as I have two minutes, is it? So, uh, how, how to reconcile this, this, um, this sort of uh, broader uh, uh, argument with the idea of a partial, of a, an equilibrium um, uh, Corruption in um, the, the approach of corruption as an equilibrium. Uh, I, I, I sympathize and I use myself this idea of uh, corruption as a self enforcing equilibrium. And um, I think it makes a lot of sense uh, in the case of Brazil. And uh, to, to some extent, we could say that there are elements in, in the Brazilian context that that suggest a, a, a move uh, in that direction, the direction of a superior uh, equilibrium. Um, because I, I don't see as feasible a return to the ex ante. Uh, in, in this respect, I, I, I agree with um, uh, Matthew. Um, uh, this is a very powerful uh, just to, to mention one, one, one issue that was uh, raised here by, by José, uh, what was the counterfactual, how to address that this uh, methodologically, right? Uh, there is experimental evidence. Danny, Danny Gindrich has his experimental piece uh, is, uh, uh, with, with very interesting results that when people are exposed to infer uh, 
it's an experimental piece on, in Costa Rica, and it, it, it uh, tests exactly this hypothesis that um, beliefs uh, about what, are, what other people are doing are crucial to the outcome. So to a, to a certain extent, to some extent, um, uh, uh, people engage in corruption uh, or are tolerant of corruption if they think that others are, are engaged in corruption. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The idea of an equilibrium is precisely this idea. And uh, I think that in, in Brazil now, uh, we, are, we are going in that direction. Uh, we can explore that uh, uh, in, in, in more detail. And um, one thing that might, might um, be, be an evidence in that direction is that petty corruption in Brazil is very small, right? Brazil, there are several metrics for that. Uh, criminalization, uh, victimization studies that show, you know, people that, uh, when, when asked, uh, has, uh, has anybody asked for a bribe in the last 12 months in Brazil? Brazil uh, is positioned very favorably compared to, to other countries in Latin America and in, in, in the world as well. And not only if they were asked, but also if they paid bribes. So there are several methodologies in all of them, Brazil, ranks very well. So the idea of a, a culture of corruption is not, uh, uh, is not uh, consistent with the, with the data. Um, so the, uh, the scenario that, uh, according to uh, the received wisdom uh, out, out there, uh, is that Brazil, uh, in the current context, would, would be in a situation very similar to uh, Italy post manipuliti right? Uh, I think Vanucci has given Manipulita a bad, bad name, right? Because he has extensively criticized what... what uh, but uh, recent uh, work by Miriam Golding has reached very different conclusions. Uh, 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 there's a, a bunch of new uh, Italian political science work on that, and uh, uh, mm. according to them, there's a very significant... Uh, effect of money polity on the, on the impact of corruption charges on re-election chances. Very, very significant. Um, so I think that's, um, that's a, a... So uh, my final comment uh, has to do with... Uh, uh, you, you talked about agenda overload but uh, what the Supreme Court in Brazil is facing, or of course you didn't mention the, the didn't focus, hasn't focused on the, the, on the Brazilian Supreme Court, but uh, uh, a lot of uh, the, the disen political disenchantment, nihilism and, and so on in Brazil these days has to do with, the, with dysfunctionalities in the Supreme Court, right? But no Supreme Court in history has ever uh, faced an agenda which includes charges ag against a hundred, one third of parliament, right? Over hundreds of politicians would be charged. Uh, in Italy, yes. But uh, we have three governors in jail or moving out and in, in jail. Yeah. Uh, a Supreme Court that in a short period of, th of, of, of time had to uh, uh, oversee the uh, three uh, impeachment procedures, right? Um, and a Supreme Court that's overloaded with uh, a court load uh, of 1,000 100,000 uh, cases per, per year, right? So this is the docket of the Supreme Court. So no Supreme Court has faced this, this uh, tremendous overload. So uh, to expect that uh, subject to such a, uh, a test stress, stress test, um, everything would go or function smoothly, it would be totally irrealistic, right? No other Supreme Court in a democracy has faced uh, 
Uh, these tasks, these are tremendous tasks, and of course, uh, things would, would be uh, politicized, there would be tremendous uh, mediatic um, exploration, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, I will um, stop, leave it here, and thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, I'll try to um, create a polemic here with my fellow panelists. And I'll try to say something that is uh, controversial. Maybe it's controversial in my mind, and so you guys are going to find it very trivial. I don't know. I'll start by saying, my friend Marcus, that I used to live in a state of Illinois where there are three governors in jail and the number of judges who have been expelled from the, 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 the state Supreme Court and judicial system. So the first controversial point I want to make is that we Brazilians, we, we are the best even in misery. It's like, it's the worst case ever of a Supreme Court in history. Or when presidentialism in Brazil is bad, it is because the when we have to accept presidentialism, but then there is the coalition, the presidentialism de coalition that makes it the worst possible ever because everything here is brought to the extreme. I disagree with that, but anyway, that's the first point. Um, so, but that wasn't what I had planned. With the second point. You, you don't, I know, you don't disagree. <laughs> um, so what I want, I, there are two points I want to make. One is the following, and one more general, another one about Brazil, that I'm going to return to what I just said. The first one is about, so we're, we're thinking about democratic controls. And when we think about democracy today, we think about representative government by necessity. There is no, no, no government that's democratic and claims to be a direct democracy. A representative government by necessity implies agency losses by the voters. In other words, if the voters are the principals and the politicians are the agents of the voters and we as voters elect the politicians, then it is intrinsic, inevitable that there will be some kind of loss from us principals to the, to the agents because there will be necessarily a moment in which the agents will act without our, inf our knowing what they are doing and our experiencing immediately the consequences of what um, they are doing. Now, a lot has been written about that and we know that there are two basic mechanisms. Democratic, you know, it, through ele elections, when I think about democracy, I'm thinking about competitive elections. And so there are two essential mechanisms for voters to exercise control over the, the agents, the, you know, the politicians. One is a prospective mechanism, the other one is a retrospective mechanism. The, the, the thing with both mechanisms is that they are both deficient, intrinsically deficient. A prospective mechanism is one in which the voter listens to what the politician has to say, the promises that the politician makes, you know, the campaign promises, decides which campaign is more credible, which one he or she as the voter prefers, and casts a ballot for the one that best serves the voter's interest. The problem, and so it is perspective because we're controlling the politician via what we expect the politician to do. Now, as a mechanism of accountability, it is deficient because we as voters, we know that we don't want that politician to be bound by the promises that the politician made two years ago when she was trying to be elected, when there is an economic crisis that's completely exogenous. And what we want is precisely a politician who is going to do the opposite of what the politician promised to do two years ago when the politician had no idea that there was going to be a crisis. So the prospective mechanism of accountability is deficient because it is not credible. The politician knows that at every point in time, the politician can go to the voter and say, listen to me, I understand, I broke my campaign promise, but I, that was the thing I should have done because that was the best course of action. And so we as voters, we are left there without knowing what to do, and then we do whatever we do as voters. Now, the other mechanism is the retrospective mechanism, right? We look at what politicians did in the past, we set some kind of bar for judging the politician, 
and we say, well, if the politician produced some results that are, at this point, I'm gonna vote for the politician. If the result is below that point, I'm gonna vote against the politician. So it is retrospective because we are looking at the past and we're evaluating what we're gonna do in the future, I mean, do now with the election on the basis of what the record of the politician. The politician knowing that we as voters are going to do that, the politician will anticipate that we're gonna reason like that and then the politician supposedly will be doing what is best for us. Except that we know also, and this is very easily demonstrated, we know that in such a framework, because the politician necessarily has information that we don't have as voters, that we are inevitably, there will be cases in which we are going to have to reward a politician that was bad. In other words, we, given that decision rule that we have, we're gonna have to vote in favor of some politician who didn't deserve our vote, or we're gonna have to punish some politician who actually did everything that was best for us as voters. So these things are not things that we can, f I mean, we can try to fix them institutionally, we can try to create institutions that will make things more, trans more transparent, that will force politicians to div divulge um, um, uh, information that are not available to us. Probably the best institution for that is the presence of a very active opposition that has the interest of revealing that information to us voters. But the fact is that there, it, it is intrinsic to the democratic practice that we as voters will necessarily, invariably, either make, pro, you know, behave in a way that, or indicate that we're gonna behave in a way that's not credible, or we're gonna behave in a way that's credible, but it's going, but it's going to let us, you know, made us make decisions that are not the best decisions for ourselves. Now, this is great. I mean, the way I read this is to say that accountability, electoral accountability works, but works at best at the margin, right? So, you know, we, we should not justify a democracy because it is a system that is going to allow us to generate politicians who always behave in ways that are accountable to the preferences of the voters, assuming that we know what these preferences are, because that's another whole question uh, about which we can raise all sorts of doubts. But assuming that we know that, you know, we cannot justify democracies by saying that we'll do what's always best for us, because we know that there will be instances in which politicians will violate that and we'll have to accept that as voters. Now, I'm not saying this to say that we should wash our hands and then not worry about anything. But I think we should worry about what we are proposing to do as a solution to that. And now trying to pick a, a, you know, provoke my friend Matthew here, you know, who showed all this, you know, the expansion of agencies and, and you know, controlling tribunals and, you know, and multiplication of agencies. I mean, these agencies, they are anything but democratic not only are not democratic, I mean, they are, they are opaque in a particular situation like the one we live in Brazil because we don't have it very clear who is the principal of those agencies. Is it the executive, is it the legislative, but which institutions in the legislature are created to oversee these agencies? Or, you know, there is this, this opaqueness there, but they are not democratic in the sense that they, 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 they may be efficient because they're gonna be acting counter the democratic process. They're gonna be able to do things that are not um, um, some things that the, you know, voters would have preferred them to do. Except that we don't know how to control them, and sometimes we lose, you know, they do things that we don't want them to do, or they do things that, you know, go a little bit beyond what we believe or we hoped that they would be doing. I mean, my personal reading, ignorant, because I follow it from, from far away, of uh, portions of the judiciary today in Brazil is that, you know, they are kind of overstepping their bounds. I mean, it's bad for the institution, and I would prefer to see an institution that is less active and less, um, you know, São Jorge or, you know, trying to, you know, fight the dragon that, um, so, 
I guess the point for us to think in terms of democratic controls is, yes, it is great to have these institutions, but what is it that we are losing by setting them up, and how is it that we can control them? Now, the second point, and this I'm gonna take Maria Herminia's question that she said somebody texted her as suggestions for questions for the table, what is the state of democracy in Brazil? And I'm gonna take this because I think the answer, you know, I would say is not so bad. And in this sense, I think we agree. Um, um, you know, that doesn't mean to say that it is perfect. You know, of course, there are things that democratically, I think, could be done. It does need institutional improvements. I, and that's where we disagree. I'm not sure I'm prepared to say with Marcus that institutions are working well or they are strong because I don't know what you mean by that. What, what institutions are you talking about? Are we talking about the presidency? Are we talking about the Congress, the Senate, the House? Are we talking about the state assemblies? Are we talking about the judiciary? Which part of the judiciary? So institutions, you know, it's a huge, a huge thing. And I'm not prepared to say that, you know, I know you agree with that because, you know, I'm just, I'm provoking you. So, you know, you can't provoke and be like accurate. So you have to. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I don't even know what the Czech institutions are. I mean, anyway, let, let me provoke you. Then you respond later. So, um, I guess the, the, the reason I'm saying this is because, and again, that's uh, proselytizing, but that's what I'm doing here. I think, you know, we all agree that we have to be specific when we talk about, I mean, talking about reforming institutions is not talking about reforming democracy in Brazil or anywhere else. I think democracy in Brazil is fine, you know, and to me it is fine to the extent that in the midst of all this crisis, we know there will be an election at the end of this year, and there will be another election in 2022, and there was one in 2014, and these elections happened with competitiveness, and with a free press, and with an opposition. You know, it's terrible. The candidates may, may be horrible. You know, and we, all we can do is to try, you know, campaign and try to, to make the ones we don't like not to get elected and try to elect the ones we like. But one thing that appalls me, and as a student of some institutions in Brazil, you know, again, picking on Matthew, poor Matthew, but he presented this graph of, you know, the circles of the precursors of the institutional problems in Brazil. And then the first one was my favorite one, which was the electoral system for to elect the Chamber of Deputies. You know, I hate that because, I mean, this, this is not, I mean, we don't know how that system works. We think that we know, and we have a lot of prejudices about how it, how it knows. And I tell you, wait for about a year or so and read this great paper that's gonna come out in some journal that shows that the elections for the Chamber of Deputies in Brazil is probably one of the least competitive in democratic regimes, okay? I'll give you this one number just to make you like wanna read it. Between 1990 and 2014, so there are seven elections for the Chamber, there were 20, about a little bit over 28,000 candidates campaigning you can exclude 14,000 14, of these candidates from the election through simulations, and those candidates, the, the, the absence of the votes of these candidates is not going to change the allocation of one seat to one, any coalition or to any political party. Those are 14,000 people, over 14,000 people, 50% of all the candidates who are absolutely irrelevant. They are terrible because they give a lot for us to complain about. All these candidates, you know, they have to, you know, corruption comes from, you know, the pressures of the, on the candidates to raise money. I mean, all the corruption scandals here, I mean, yes, there are 140 members of Congress um, being indicted, but I mean, everybody, you know, the corruption comes to finance executive elections. It's not to finance, you know, the legislative elections, which are relatively cheap. The other thing that I want to mention, which is your third cycle, circle, Matthew, is presidentialism de coalizão. It took us a while to have to live with presidentialism. Everybody wanted to have a parliamentary system. Now, it you know, keeps coming back to the agenda, but you know, I don't think anybody realistically think that, thinks that it's going to be uh, adopted. But now, there is the qualification de coalizão, which now becomes a pejorative. 
to say that presidential, that the formation of a government in Brazil is so bad that you know it's tomalada ka and all that parties care about is to negotiate ministries and so on. Now I ask you, Germany just what two weeks ago had a new government after six months of negotiation. Do you think that they're negotiating about whether they're going to add like 10% to the budget to increase social insurance or because they were negotiating about who's going to get, have control of this or that? Or Belgium had what, 18 months without a government negotiating, negoti I mean, we have to stop thinking that these things happen in Brazil in a way that doesn't happen in other places. I mean, presidencialism de coalizão is multi-party presidentialism, which is multi-party democracy. And in multi-party democracies, you have to negotiate and bargain. And the, the currency that you have to bargain are offices and policies. And it, you know, it's, it is tomalada ka. That's what it means to form a coalition government in Brazil, in Germany, in Belgium, even in England, when the, you know, the rare occasion when they form one. So I, I think we, you know, that's what I meant to say, that even we tend to be pessimistic. We, we raise the bar for us as a country, as citizens of a country, as voters. We raise the bar very high, and we tend to think that the things that don't work here, they don't work here because we are special. No, we are normal, right? And we do everything the way people do. You know, politics is, is politics. So, and we're trying to put people in jail. And some of them are going to jail, and some are not. So, thank you. So uh, I will um, just say a few words before opening up uh, for debate. Um, the, our discussion is about democratic controls. So I took this uh, book, Democracy for Realists, by Aiken and Bartel as my springboard <coughs> to uh, propose a discussion. Because they say that um, if you were to be realistic, if we were to look at, at how democracies work, real work, like this um, Nelson Rodriguez view of uh, democracy, democracies as they really are, uh, we would have to conclude that uh, elections do not produce responsive government. So their conclusion is democracies or elections all over the world, and, but they only analyze the US, uh, they do not produce responsible, uh, responsive government. So there is no accountability, accountability you can get from or through elections. So I, I want just to make uh, some claims about this uh, work, or uh, this line of work, because this is uh, a very uh, um, um, usual way of working. So it's kind of a way in which you uh, compare uh, what they call the um, um, folk democratic uh, theory against the realist uh, democratic theory. But the folk theory is never spelled out. So we don't know what would be the ideal democracy. What we only know is how real democracies work and how, what is the distance between the real and what it should be, but what it should be. So, and what I think that I miss, I, I ended up missing as I read that book is that they never give us the criteria that voters should use if we were to have control over the government. They just list negative features, what is missing, what we don't observe. But they never say for us, what is the criteria? And it, they are not alone, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at Schumpeter, if you read Schumpeter, it's the same. So, what would be much the criteria? Better. Much better, right. <laughs> but so there is always this debunking, this negative view without any alternative. So what they say is that uh, the most close to they, they get to test something that would uh, give us 
uh, a, 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 a way of evaluating is, they say, um, that voters should punish or reward um, rulers uh, to things that are related to their competence. So we should observe what they do, see if they were responsible for the outcome, judge and say, well, they are the ones that did it, or they are not, they are just sharks that uh, uh, attack at the, at, at the sea, and so the government could not do anything. So what they sh try to show is that we do not pu we punish when governments should not have been punished, and we, we, we reward when they should not be rewarded. So, for instance, the commodity boom. So we reward the government, but the government has done nothing to be rewarded. So the <clears throat> thing is, this word competent. Com how, how, how should I? Say? Competent. 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 competent, competent, this is not English, competent. <laughs> so how do, how do we, how do we, can we, how, how can voters know that? So for instance, macroeconomic policy and if the government is responsible for economic growth. So economists disagree about that. Yeah. They have reviews that are about that. They do not agree. They, fight about that. Why voters should be able to decide something that specialists are unable to, to do. And when it comes to the negative view of voters, what do they emphasize? That, go, that um, voters act out of feelings, emotion, and loyalty. So voters are not rational. In there. So what would a rational voter do? We never know that. There is no uh, specification of this, uh, uh, um, the, 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 how to evaluate that. So what I want to say with that, there is this a big ju jump now, a big step. So it's, so what, what we are assuming here is as if there was something that would be something that the government should do, that we know what it is, and we can't just say right or wrong. So as if there was one policy for everything, for economy, for health, for education, that's as if this was said, as if we were not in a dis disagreement about this kind of thing. That's what we fight about. That's what divides us. That's what brings us to elections and to vote to different parties. That's the thing about what we compete for. So we, we have divergent views about good policy. And it seems that we have a diff hard time to understand that and to put this into the model. And um, so this brings me to, uh, I think, to a, an ambig ambiguity there that uh, all these discussions have uh, between rationality and interests. So one thing is to be rational. The other thing is to have an interest. And I think that democratic theory or behavior, voting behavior or whatever has this all this difficulty of deciding interest and rationality. And when we uh, speak about accountability, what the government should be responding to, to the voters that put them there, who voted for them, or for the whole society? They, they should respond to the majority that elected them, to their interests, or to the general interest of the society, of the common good. So that's what we never decide. And that's the ambiguity in all this debate, that we move back and forth between these two views. And we solve this 
linguistically or argumentatively, but not <clears throat> really. So, and this I think that has to, a lot to do with corruption and the view about interests. So there is one view about corruption that is breaking the law. But corruption is a, ten, a, a, a word or a um, team that is there for a long, long time that we have been working with it. So when we come to analyze voters or the government or rulers, what, what is the, the way we think about them? What is the requisites that we put as for good behavior? That they should be independent. And so the idea, why, we, why poor people would not, in the past did not have the right to vote? Because they were not independent. They would vote according to their interest or would sell their votes. What are the good rulers in the model are those that have no interest, that are above, above interests. So all these um, teams go back and forth on this ambiguity uh, between rationality and interest, independence and interests. And this, I think, is a hard um, line to draw and to think about these things. And we kind of, kind of use these words and solve the, the problems with creating new words and new concepts that kind of hide the real problem be, below the, the, the table. So this is just what I uh, wanted to bring to discussion, to debate. So we are here to debate and not to, I have no <coughs> solution to these questions, I just want to bring them to, to discussion. So um, I guess uh, now we can uh, proceed with um, questions from the public or, and then, can, can or a, a very around brief... us uh, first. No, just a very oh. brief comment to, to help organize the discussion. I think we focused on different things here. Uh, so, I and, and Matthew, we focused on um, wrongdoing, right? On power abuse. So, the history of, of governance in Latin America and Brazil is, is the history of abuse, abuse of power by rulers, right? So, the, that, that was our focus. Uh, uh, you guys focused on what I would call policy drift. So policy drift is inevitable, uh, right? And, and, and accountability and, and representation, democratic accountability as accountability is an impossibility. That's fundamentally what Hannah Pitkin said a long time ago, right? Um, uh, accountability in this sense would be it would be uh, a ruler, uh, uh, representatives receiving instructions from, from, from voters, right? There are so many problems with this view that uh, 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 informational asymmetries, uh, you, you name it. So our, our, our focus here was on wrongdoing and because you, you, uh, you can't imagine that you delegate authority when you vote, that voters delegate power to, to representatives uh, to, uh, to benefit them uh, in, in their pursuit of self-enrichment, right? That is uh, an absurd. Uh, and and uh, one point that I, I, I jumped in my presentation is that the image that I, I, I used to capture the delegation of powers because one thing uh, uh, Zé, uh, that voters can do is to delegate powers, not to delegate, but to oversight institutions, which themselves will, will uh, 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 check representatives and governments, right? So this element was very present in, in, 
in, in our constituent assembly in 1988, uh, the image that we use is that we needed a, a strong leash for a big dog. We are delegating a lot of powers to, to uh, the president. Presidents emerged extremely powerful, constitutionally speaking, in our constitutional design. But at the same time, uh, there was delegation of power to check institutions so as to prevent abuse of power by, by these extremely powerful presidents. So but those are not voters delegating power, those are the constituents. Let, let's see, yeah. Not, not only with the purpose of, uh, uh, there was, in, in the specific case of Brazil, there was a coalition of interests of uh, liberals which were primarily interested uh, in, in abuse of power and, and uh, progressives or whatever you want, those opposed to the military <clears throat> regime that were primarily uh, uh, interested in, in preventing uh, human rights abuse and, and, and so on and so forth. That's why, that's the rationale for delegating so much power to the public ministry and to, do, to, to the courts. There was this coalition of liberals and, and, and the left, if you want, which was, and corruption was low in the agenda. You, 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 you don't see people talking about the corruption when they were delegating power to the public ministry, right? The issue was abuse of power on the one hand, and on the other, human rights abuse uh, in, uh, against uh, former prisoners, political uh, prisoners, and so on. Matthew. Yeah, so um, Zay is very good at picking a fight in a jovial way, and so it was, it was fun. But um, I, I'm going to pick up on Marcos's last point. Um, yeah, no, well, I'm coming back to you. Um, but, but I think that uh, this, this notion of delegation, there was a lot of delegation to the president. There was also a lot of delegation to the Ministerio Público and to the courts. But what's interesting is the powers that were delegated to the president were taken up immediately. Whereas I think that the courts and the Ministerio Público took a long time because there was a generational shift that, that took had to take place first before they took up the full extent of their powers. And so when you look at these two institutions, uh, they are, and I think, I think this is where I pick up on, on Zay's point, you know, the, these are institutions that have taken full advantage of some aspects of independence and not others until recently. And so I think it's no uh, mistake in comparative perspective, the Brazilian court system is the most expensive by a, a, a mag an order of magnitude anywhere in the world. There's no expen more expensive court system. And expensive. expensive, expensive like money. Uh, money, money. So the Brazilian court system costs 1.7% of GDP. Most countries, it's around a half a percent of GDP. And so, you know, so they were given a lot of independence. And I think you're, the question that you raise is the central question. How do you check that independence? And Marcos is, is the expert on this. But, but I think that to a certain extent, um, you know, we're going to see those checks now. Now that the courts are getting deeper and deeper into the political game, we already saw this complaint about auxilio moragia, uh, you know, payments uh, for housing and things like that. But I think that this is a constant concern in democratic theory about who guards the guardians, way back to, to Aristotle. What, what's interesting, though, um, that I think uh, is important for us to keep in mind, I'm not, a, I'm not arguing that coalitional presidentialism is bad. We're, we're both fans of Borgen, uh, the show about Denmark, and Denmark, of course, is high in the anti-corruption field. And one of the constant refrains there is, how do you put together coalitions, and how dirty is this process of putting together coalitions? So I don't think Brazil is unique. Denmark has coalitions, after all. Uh, but I think, um, you know, I went back and I looked at all the, all the politicians elected at the federal level since the turn of the century, and fully 28% of the 1,500 politicians are facing charges. Mm -hmm. And so they're facing charges. This is the dark side of a, what doesn't have to be a negative thing. I think coalitional presidentialism makes the system run, but there is the dark side. And I don't think we can ignore the dark underbelly here. And then, you know, the, the issue, though, is that the courts are not doing much to constrain that 30% of Congress that is, that is corrupt. Now, um, 
it just so happens that this morning I read the Estadón, which I never get to read uh, in Washington, uh, at the hotel, and, and one of the op-eds is exactly about maybe we need in Brazil to implement electoral controls over the judiciary. Oh, Thank you, yes, and that was my response too. Like, it, it, there are many ways to control and to check, but there are some that are far worse than others, so I guess I'd, I'd go back to that. So let's open to the floor. So people is kind of uh, afraid. Please, where is the mic? Here, in the middle, there. First of all, thank you for the presentation. It was very good. I always learn a lot, Professor Marcus and the other ones. And I have three questions, actually. <laughs> and the first one to Professor Max Andre is that, uh, as far as I got, your main argument is based on two external international factors to, to uh, say a little bit on the decline of Brazil's, I don't know, Brazil's being pop. And the first argument, uh, there are many are economists that say that the, the change in macroeconomic policy in Brazil, it happened in 2006 with Montega getting into power and not uh, because of the international crisis. International crisis will be like, um, not a trigger effect, but um, to, to what they have been doing since 2006. Uh, and, and having this in mind, I'm, I was just wondering, because these two explanations, they, they kind of reinforce PT argument that the problem uh, came from the outside. So we were doing a good administration, and oh, something bad happened outside, and the boom of commodities, they went down, and now we have a fiscal problem. So would this argument reinforce this discourse, is the question. And the second question, uh, you, you began your presentation saying, is there anything wrong with Brazilian institutions? And as far as I got your argument and what I have been reading from you is the answer is probably no, our institutions, they're, they're fine. And if, if this answer is really your answer, no, my question is, is there anything that you, sh you see today that uh, it, it could improve, you know, in terms institutionally speaking. And another question now to Professor Shebub. Um, the problem that you, you started your presentation with uh, telling the inefficiency of vote and other mechanisms, they kind of remind me the problem of time inconsistency. That is a, a, a problem that uh, macroeconomists, they deal a lot of with. And the result that, uh, like the, how to do, deal with it, they, they say it's the independence of central bank. So what, like for most critics, they would say that this is a non-democratic solution. So uh, when we, we think in terms of politics and democracy, I was just wondering whether efficiency would be a good criteria to uh, evaluate our the institutions, or if not, uh, maybe uh, Professor Limongi raised some some uh, reflections on it, on rationality, interests, and uh, I was just wondering maybe welfare, or how, how could you do something to deal with time inconsistency, but from a political perspective. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ivan Fernandes, I'm from the Federal University of ABC. Uh, we talk about, a lot about in this crisis, about if institutions are having a good or a bad performance. But I want to make a very simple question. How we can measure a good performance of the institutions? Uh, 
Sometimes I think that if people are not dying in the streets due to the, the political crisis, people are dying in the streets, but related with other problems, with security, public policies in Brazil, but people were in the streets against Dilma, in favor of Lula, against Lula, in favor of Dilma. Everybody was uh, dressing in yellow t-shirts. People were two, three million of people in the streets. Um, almost nobody died in the political crisis. So the institutions in a quite very difficult way were able to handle the problems that we were facing. And until now, we are able to keep democracy working and we are going to have elections in the in the end of the in the end of the year. But how we can measure that? How we can think that oh we have institutions that are doing their job? The task is very difficult. Of course, we know it is one of the most biggest crises in the history of Brazil. But how we can say something about that? The last one. Well, I'm Pedro from State University of Rio de Janeiro, and I would like to pose a question to Professor Sheibub relating to this general evaluation of how democracy more or less is functioning as it should be in Brazil, bringing the question that somehow political debate in Brazil was divided between two poles of interpretation of what happened in 2016, one claiming that it was a routine procedure that follow all the rules and so it was more or less legitimate in a sense, and they call it impeachment, and the other poll which claimed that it was a coup, said that it was a parliamentary majority that out the president that was elected. And this evaluation, how do you place your general evaluation of democracy that periodic elections are going on when within this debate of, of political and naming of the event? All three questions, all three questions, um, in my view, they are related and they have to do with um, how to evaluate democracy. And, and here, I'm going to make it very clear. This is, I mean, obviously, it's something that has been in my mind and, uh, you know, a lot of people's minds. And I found a lot of clarity and, you know, in, my, in Adam Shevorsky, who has given me a lot Intellectually, he gave me even more later on in a book called Self-Government or Democracy and Self-Rule. The, the Limits of Self-Government. The Limits of Self-Rule. And so I'm going to just you know, tell you how I read his book, which I think answers these questions about how to evaluate whether it's efficiency or welfare. It's none of that. Um, the way I read that book is this, which is a little bit what I tried to do in my talk yesterday. We, you take every single justification for democracy that has been put forth, forward in, in democratic theory, they all fail. Representation, accountability, equality, uh, liberty, uh, you know, participation. And they fail not because democracy fails them, but because there are intrinsic problems with them that any regime, any political system that tried to create to generate those outcomes would have problems with. But the, so, at that, I, and I, that's kind of something that I knew and I had in mind and he always talked about and I talked about with Fernando for a lot, a, a long time. And I always say this, okay, so if there is nothing about democracy, what is there that makes us want it? Yesterday, somebody mentioned in the morning, in the round table, somebody mentioned the idea of, you know, democracy is the best, I don't remember exactly the formulation, but the Churchillian thing that, you know, it is the, the worst of all, it's the best of all possible, of the all bad regimes that exist. In other words, we tolerate democracy because we cannot have anything else. 
I always felt that that was also not very satisfactory because, you know, why is it that we have to accept something that is just, you know, the second best, the third best, the fourth best, and so on. And I think Adam Chewowski gave an answer which he had already given before but he articulated in this book, which is this. We tend to think that democracy is just being able to remove the incumbents from power. And the key is in the just. And he says, why just? I mean, this is a lot, right? Because it is a way to do it without having violence. It is a way to, in which, you know, in, in countries where democracy works, including Brazil, you know, Dilma Rousseff was impeached and she was told to go home because there was a process that led to the result that, you know, implied that she should go home, and she went home, and the vice president came in. But more important than that, you know, when Fernando Henrique, you know, was lame duck, and there was a competition, and Lula won power, everybody gave Lula the key to the palace, and he governed for eight years. He was reelected, and so on. This is, I mean, we have to just look at our own history to realize that it has not always been so easy to be able to replace the person who, or the people, or the group who is in charge for something else. So that's how I evaluate democracy. You know, it is the fact that we're not fighting with one another to decide who is gonna be ruling, who's gonna be calling the shots for everybody else. Now, the impeachment, the way I see the impeachment is a moment of crisis. It was an extremely political process because it is impeachment, you know, and crises are political like that. We're talking about the presidency of the country. It would be silly to believe that everybody's impartial and the chamber and the Senate are gonna be behaving partially. But it is a moment of crisis. It is designed as a moment of crisis. Impeachment is not the normal. The normal is when you have an election and the, the president serves for four years and sometimes gets reelected, sometimes doesn't. So we have to distinguish this. I mean, a crisis is a crisis, but it doesn't mean that the institutions or the, 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 the regime that encompasses that institution you know, is, is failing or is problematic. I mean, the regime is working. It would be bad if as a result of the crisis, people went, people went to the streets and started to break everything. The police came on and killed people, and then there would be an escalation of violence and then somebody would have to do something, and then all of a sudden, we cannot expect to have an election in 2018 anymore. That is, I think, the breakdown of democracy. But now, you know, it's terrible. I mean, I personally think it was a terrible outcome. It's distasteful. I don't like the president who is in, in power. But again, I prefer to wait until it's time to elect somebody else and then cast a ballot, then to go and get an arm and try to kill the guy and kill whoever is in power. And so that's the justification. It's not welfare, it's not representation, it's not accountability, because all of these are flawed. And this is what Schumpeter said with, uh, uh, with his, his analysis of what he called the classical theory of democracy, and he offered something that was already pretty good at that point, but I think it was complemented by this line by Shavrovsky, which I think of the people I've read is the, first, is the only person in, contem in the contemporary debate about democracy that's offering a normative justification for democracy that does not entail any of the substantive outcomes that democracies are supposed to, um, to generate in these theories. It's just because we like it, because it prevents war. So let me pick up on that and um include something else that we started to discuss yesterday. So first, uh, there is an English politician that says, I read, he said, and I don't remember who he is, but he said, we count heads so that we don't break heads, so that, that we don't crack heads or something like that. So that's the substitute. So we count, we vote. That's the substitute for violence. So, but there is one thing that we started to discuss yesterday that is, what is the limit that it's legitimate uh, um, role of opposition between elections? What the, the opposition can do that is, that is allowed to do uh, between elections is just run elections? 
So there's a, 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 an ambiguity, ambiguity here, what, it's, what the opposition can do. So in the beginning of the representative government, it could do nothing. It had to wait to the next election. Because if the, the government was elected, and it was elected um, by the standard rules, it was legitimate, and any opposition would be considered subversive, illegal, and uh, questioning the order and this kind of stuff. So the opposition has been always conquering or testing the limits of this, what is uh, legal, what is illegal, what is uh, 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 allowed opposition, what it cannot do. So this is the hard um, division, right? What's considered to be a move that is out of the constitutional uh, uh, rules and that you can, cannot do. For instance, in Brazil, all the debate about it's a coup, it's not a coup, is did the opposition went above what was allowed to do or not? So there was a part of the opposition that four days after uh, uh, Dilma was re-elected was here at the Paulista Avenue saying, we want a military coup. Mm -hmm. And then this and ended up going to the impeachment process. But th there is this, always this test. I'm not saying, saying this is always hard to tell what is the limit when the opposition uh, step over the line that it became uh, illegitimate its action. So, and Can I, uh, I agree entirely with, with you, but I, I'd say that uh, Bill Riker came first, right, in this, this version, this um, approach to democracy as popular veto, right? The idea of democracy is throwing the rascals out, right? Uh, which is essentially the same. Uh, it just uh, uh, it's the, a the continuation is, of the Schumpeterian uh, yeah, tradition. Yeah, the main point is that is a way of putting the rascals out through votes. Yeah, uh, the method is is what, it, and the method has consequences. And that's something that I think that uh, what I was trying to, 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 to tell in my, my intervention is that we have to take into account the intrinsic uh, qualities or mechanisms that are, in tie, are part of elections. Elections is a very specific way of uh, selecting or choosing that has intrinsic qualities. So that's the point by Bernard Manin when he says, well, this mechanism makes us vote in some, someone that is different than us, and, that, and it favors some type of people. And he says, well, this, this was known, but the mechanism was not known, right? There, there was the intuition that it should produce this um, um, aristocratic uh, that he had this aristocratic element. So this uh, mechanism has changed a lot during the experience. And I think that what political theory has not gone through uh, is what is the mechanism and how this mechanism has adapted to this new environment. That's, that's the point, I think. But uh, uh, the, the other element, I think that it is a, 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 a majoritarian, mm -hmm. uh, to use the language of majoritarian uh, versus consensual or, or, or consensual proportional Bingham Powell or uh, whoever you want to, to refer to. Uh, because the, in, in, pro, in the normative uh, view of democracy associated with the the proportional uh, design or consensual design uh, uh, and so on, uh, the opposition has a place, right? The idea is not to, to uh, the opposition to, uh, to, to stand aside and wait 
for, for those elected. Uh, the opposition works in committees, uh, works through various uh, uh, institutions in which it can play, uh, participate in, 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 uh, in, 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 the, in the governing uh, process. But uh, uh, I want to respond to, uh, to three excellent questions uh, that uh, um, Regarding, regarding the role of exogenous, it, it's really important because I, I think that the crisis in, in Brazil, uh, uh, in, in, in Brazil is not a product of external forces, not at all. It's just that these, those, those uh, shocks, they essentially, those shocks essentially triggered or unleashed, right? Um, uh, cr the crisis that was already uh, being being um, was uh, underway, right? For for several reasons that we don't have the time to. Uh, but I think it's very important to to mention that okay. because much of the malaise that followed and continues up to this day, this date, up to now. Uh, is a product of this colossal crisis that we had. It's the worst recession in a hundred years, right? And at the same time, it's the worst corruption scandal uh, ever, uh, right? But, but it's a gargantuan uh, uh, corruption scandal. So we should not uh, forget that. So, uh, but um, some elements of of uh, disenchantment with with uh, the, our institutional landscape arise arose before that, right? Appeared in 2013 during the the, the prote protests and so on. And unemployment in 2013 was in its lowest uh, level ever in Brazil, right? Four uh, percent. So it was. Um, uh, what happened then? Uh, that had to do with other things. And there is one element that uh, is, is uh, truly institutional, right? In 2013, people, among other things, were protesting against the quality of public services, uh, inflation, uh, corruption, right? But also, uh, there was this uh, widespread dissatisfaction with, with the working of the political system. Um, and that has to do with coalitional uh, presidentialism. That's one element. Uh, th this is the only uh, uh, caveat, you know, in my, uh, I, I don't buy, as I said, this, this, this view that coalitional uh, presidentialism is to blame and so on. But there's one element which universal, wh whatever you have uh, systems with a, a proportional constitutional design, you have problems of clarity of responsibility, right? And, and also, uh, if you have uh, coalitions that are too heterogeneous, you have problems of, of legitimacy. So in Brazil, in the 2012, we had uh, Fernando Haddad in Sao Paulo, for example, shaking hands with Paulo Maluf, the quintessential corrupt politicians. So this kind of extremely heterogeneous uh, uh, coalitions that we had in Brazil, and under the PT we had extreme heterogeneity. Uh, you have, as member of the coalition, parties in, in, the, in the left and in the right at the extremes of the, the political spectrum. This caused cynicism, public cynicism, Civic cynicism, the idea that you, know, you do whatever you want because there's no rational in that, that kind of alliances. So this is an element that in Brazil, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, it is, is um, cause of, um, of malaise, of disenchantment, and so on. And this, is, uh, uh, this has to do with coalitional uh, uh, presidentialism, particularly uh, in, in the form that it, 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 it uh, you know, has been uh, what we see in, in, in Brazil. Uh, this question, are institutions fine? I think there's no bias. 
as if uh, a binary answer would be possible. That, that's nonsense, right? Uh, depends on the institutions uh, and, and so on. So on the whole, I think that the, the data that uh, Matthew has, has showed us, and I have lots of other data uh, here that we don't have the time to, to mention, uh, on various, just to mention one, right? The, our audit institutions uh, the, the TCU in Brazil, uh, according to, the, to the, the rank produced by the International Budget uh, 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 Project, is the 10th best in the world. So it's ahead of its counterparts in France, Italy, Spain, and a bunch of other uh, advanced democracies. So uh, this is just one, one example of another institution that we never refer to. I, I did some research on audit institutions in, 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 in Latin America, and I mean, you go to the state uh, audit uh, institution in Minas Gerais, it has 400 technicians, you know, lawyers, economists, engineers, and so on. You go to uh, its counterpart in, in Mendoza, one of the wealthiest Argentinian uh, you, you find there four people, four technicians there, compared to 400 in Minas. Could be that it's just more efficient <laughs> in than in Minas. But it's not. It's, okay. uh, in Minas, it's nothing not. is I, efficient. I could give you some... Uh, so the, 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 the strength yeah. of some institutions in Brazil should not be underestimated. Uh, ah, so this to. idea that we, you could have an answer is, is, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, clarity of responsibility is an issue that I, I, uh, I mentioned, and protests were about also clarity of responsibility problems. Closing remarks, Jose Shaibub, Matthew first. Um, I'll close and comment. So, um, comment. Comment. So, um, you know, I also think, going back to your point, Ze, on um, Shaworski, I mean, Pitkin also, a long time ago, brought up this issue of the inherent tension between the goals and objectives of democracy, that you just can't reconcile them all. They will always be in tension. Um, on this issue, uh, I, I did want to pick up on TCU. Marcos has done a lot of good work on this. I mean, arguably, the, the TCU was the first institution in Brazil to actually pick up on wrongdoing at Petrobras, and they were overridden by first Congress and then by a veto from Lula. So this is, uh, I think, important to keep in mind. And then on the larger question of institutions, are they working or not, I agree with everything that was said. Uh, as a foreign observer, I don't want to come down on one side or the other, but I think that it's important to think about institutional stability as a dynamic process that's constantly being reconstructed. And if you think about what the big controversies were over the past five years about the legitimacy of what control institutions were doing, all of the most important controversies were about whether the rules were being followed. So you think about like Lewandowski running the trial, the impeachment trial in the Senate, there was a debate about whether it was correct to uh, convict Dilma but maintain her political rights. You think about uh, this question that was asked this morning, are citizens all being treated equally? That is, is Lula being judged by a different criteria than Cunha or Aesio or whoever? Uh, the controversy over the prisão preventiva, the preventative detention. This is not a question about whether the institution be, should be followed. It's a question about whether the rules are being followed adequately, I think. Mm -hmm. so. Good. No, I, I don't have Marcus. So. Oh, thank you. Marcus? You want to say it? So, I guess we are about... So, we have a break of 30 minutes. As the last time, we have a coffee at the across the um, across the what? Across across <laughs> across. You move. You go across the hall. Yes. So thank you very much. And.